After winning the interzonal tournament, Fisher began the 1971 candidate tournament in Vancouver, Canada. Most people will also remember 1971 as the most impressive year of Fisher. In the quarterfinals of the event, Fisher played a grandmaster and professional pianist, Mark Tamanov, who came to Canada under the guidance of Mikhail Botvinnik. Ironically, a few months before, the former world champion stated about Fisher, Fisher has been declared a genius. I don't agree with this. In order to rightly be declared a genius in chess, you have to defeat equal opponents by a big margin. As yet, he hasn't done this. Tymanov suffered the most humiliating defeat in the history of the candidate tournaments. 6-0 to Fisher. According to the attendees of the event, after the last move of the last match, a sad Tamanov lifted his shoulders as a sign of surrender and sobbed, I still have my music. Actually, no, because the Russian authorities, after that crushing loss, prohibited Tamanov to be seen again in public, including concerts. In the semi-finals, the next opponent of Fischer was the Danish grandmaster, Bent Larsen. According to several biographies, both Spassky and Botvinnik again predicted a victory for Larsen. Spassky said, Larsen is a little stronger in spirit than Fischer, while Botvinnik said, I think Larsen has unpleasant surprises in store for Fischer, all the more since having dealt with Tamanov thus, Fischer will want to do just the same to Larsen, and this is impossible. Fischer devastated the poor Danish grandmaster 6-0 once again. Winning a match 6-0 against the grandmaster is almost impossible. But imagine winning two 6-0 matches in a row, and according to the chess metric, those two games combined have been calculated as the highest performances ever scored in the history of chess. And this incredible rating record stands as of today. The final of the 1971 candidate tournament was to play against former world champion Tigran Petrosian. Interviewed by the Russian press, Petrosian admitted that it would only take a few games to win and the final wouldn't last the full 12 rounds since Fischer couldn't be considered a genius but only a great player. On this occasion, and based on previous predictions, Botvinnik and Spassky had the decency to shut up and not release interviews or predictions for the final. Knowing the defensive style and the skills of Petrosian and the importance of the match, Fischer was truly performing in the greatest occasion of his life, with the potential of making history. And so he did. The match, as predicted by Petrosian, lasted less than the 12 games, but in favour of Fischer. Six and a half versus two and a half. Between Bobby Fischer and the title of world champion, there was only one man, Boris Spassky. Negotiations to arrange world championship matches wasn't easy since Fischer wanted more money as prize money, and both players just couldn't agree on the location. But finally, the players agreed to hold the tournament in Reykjavik in Iceland, and the final prize money was increased to $250,000, an extraordinarily high amount for a chess prize, which in today's terms would be approximately $1.6 million. What attracted the attention of the many commentators before the tournament was the obsessive physical training by Fischer. He spent hours swimming, playing tennis and boxing. In a few interviews before the World Championship tournament, Fischer remarked that the physical preparation was a key for him to feel good and in shape for long chess matches. The 11th of July 1972, the match of the century was ready to begin. The eyes of the entire world were set upon that chessboard there in Reykjavik. It wasn't only simply a prestigious World Championship series of chess games. This was more a parallel of the Cold War. It started with the nuclear arms race, then the space race. But now America dared to challenge Russia at what they'd mastered for decades, chess. For the first time in history, chess was broadcast live on American TVs. But despite shockingly losing the first match and forfeiting the second, Fischer grinded Spassky down in the following matches, winning the tournament 12 and a half to eight and a half and with that becoming the 11th undisputed chess world champion. The achievement of Fischer was better described by Grandmaster Timon when he said the story of a lonely hero who overcomes an entire empire, or the words of Gary Gasparov, 
a crushing moment in the midst of the Cold War. But despite his popularity increasing enormously, celebrated as a hero once back in the United States, Fisher never played chess publicly for several years due to a disagreement with the FIDE rules. He decided to forfeit his title of world champion to Anatoly Karpov in 1975, and this was arguably the saddest decision of Fisher's life. Not only because he gave up his title without a fight, but also because every chess enthusiast would have enjoyed one of the most amazing matches ever. And this is also something which affected Karpov until today, since he was really keen to play Fischer, as he remarked in several recent interviews. The real reason why he didn't want to play Karpov will always remain a mystery. The official reason stated by Fischer was the disagreement with FIDE over the World Championship rules. Fischer pushed for a 10-win tournament. Unlimited games and draws are meaningless. The first player who reaches 10 wins wins a tournament and becomes world champion. But Fischer wanted an additional rule. In case of a 9-9 parity, he would have retained the title. FID didn't agree on this specific rule. Honestly, it seemed just too much to forfeit the title over just such a seemingly petty tantrum. But in addition, Fischer's rating was higher than Karpov's, and according to many chess experts, Fischer should certainly have won by a small margin. And despite three years of inactivity, Karpov himself admitted that in 1975 he would have had a lesser chance of beating Fischer, so we don't really believe that the reason was that draw-odd rule. Another theory on why Fischer forfeited the title is that he quit playing chess in his mind. Three years of inactivity seems to be evidence that Fischer was no longer interested in playing chess tournaments, at least publicly. After winning the world champion title, Fischer lost any motivation to carry on with chess. And despite not admitting it publicly, he already decided to walk away from chess tournaments in 1972. Another theory is related to his mental health. Fischer was developing mental instability and he needed auto-isolation. Speculation was rife about his mental problems, but none of it actually had any evidence of being true or correct. So we just dismissed them all out of hand. In reality, as we've stated, the reason why Fischer didn't attend the 1975 World Championship remains unknown. But however, years later, in an interview with Sports Illustrated, one of his few friends may help us better understand what Fischer's true feelings were towards chess. The Grandmaster Peter Bayassas described Fischer as having little or no motivation in playing chess, since he knew that nobody could beat him. After losing several times to Fischer while the former world champion was staying at his house, the Grandmaster said about Fischer, he was too good. There was no use in playing him. It wasn't like I made this mistake or that mistake. It was like I was being gradually outplayed from the start. He wasn't taking any time to think. The most depressing thing about it is that I wasn't even getting out of the middle game to an end game. I don't even remember an end game. He honestly believes there is no one for him to play. No one worthy of him. I played him and I can attest to that. The very last game played publicly by Fischer was the 1992 rematch against Spassky. This sort of rematch of the game of the century was played in Belgrade when Yugoslavia was still under US sanctions and embargo. And despite being informed by the US Department of Treasury that this match would have had serious legal consequences since it was taking place in an embargoed nation, Fischer decided to carry on and play Spassky. The outcome was in line with the historic match of 1972, with Fischer winning 10-5. This was the last time we saw Fischer in front of a chessboard. Now, it's not our intention to speculate on the last part of Fischer's life and to discuss his political opinions. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you can find in the description below some of the articles we've used to produce these videos. If you're watching on Reddit or Facebook, please go to YouTube and search Deeper Globalism, and you'll find our channel and the links to the material in the video. And they do contain a lot of information on Fischer's views of the world. But for once, we're not keen to discuss politics here. This video is about one of the greatest players of the best and perhaps most intellectually challenging games in the world. 
We don't even want to speculate on his mental condition, which apparently has never been fully analysed by competent doctors. After spending a few years in the Philippines and one arrest in Japan, Fisher obtained citizenship of Iceland, and he lived the last years of his life reclusively there in Iceland. He passed away at the age of 64 due to kidney failure and was buried in Iceland. The Grand Master Yasser Serowan, after having a chance to speak with Fisher during his rematch with Spassky in 1992, stated that After September the 23rd, 1992, I threw most of what I'd ever read about Bobby out of my head. Sheer garbage. Bobby is the most misunderstood, misquoted celebrity walking the face of the earth. We perfectly know that geniality comes with a price. History has taught us that the greatest musicians, painters, writers and so on need to pay a heavy price for their terrific gift. For us, that we all love chess, we know that Fisher was, not, was no different from Michelangelo, Leonardo or Einstein. He expressed his art moving knights and bishops instead of brushes or pens. In this video series, we wanted to follow the approach set out by GM Yasser Serowan and evaluate Fisher for who he was in front of a chessboard, forgetting all the nonsense written and said about him. We just want to remember that moment when he touched for the first time a chessboard. We wanted to remember him climbing the ratings of the US chess world. We wanted to remember him touching the sky of Reykjavik in front of the entire world. We wanted to remember him representing the nation which used to love him, humiliating the Russian players over and over. And we want to teach our kids his moves and his games. We want to remember one of the greatest legends in the history of chess. Ciao Bobby, rest in peace, genius.